Hi, my name is Ashley Ward. I'm the um, team leader for the melanoma sarcoma team at the FDA, and it's a great pleasure to be here with all of you this morning in this beautiful place. Um, so I wanted to welcome you to the Weston at National Harbor and um, you know, let you know that this the idea for this workshop really started back in February at the at a breakfast with the melanoma research um, group and the you know a bunch of leaders in the field. And subsequently, we had further discussions between the FDA and the MRA about how important this area of research is and how it would be a great time uh, as the, the field is just really getting started to kind of try to get together and have a conversation in the community to try to organize our efforts, identify best practices, um, identify opportunities for collaboration and harmonization of our efforts in order to really speed drug development in this area. So this workshop is the culmination of those talks, and I really appreciate uh, all of you coming to join us and participate in this continuing conversation. Um, I'll just give you a high-level uh, overview of the structure. We're going to start off with uh, an opening um, uh, talk by uh, Suzanne Tupalian, one of my co-chairs, who will just give a keynote lecture discussing the role and rationale for neoadjuvant therapy in melanoma. Uh, we'll then have three uh, sessions that are meant to give sort of the foundational experience. Um, the first session will be foundational experience for other from other areas in oncology. And then we'll have a session on uh, the current experience with melanoma in the neoadjuvant space. And then we'll uh, have a third session on optimal clinical trial design and uh, patient selection. And uh, following the completion of those, we'll have lunch, and then we will conclude with a panel session that will be moderated by Keith Flaherty, in which we'll really try to um, have an a in-depth discussion about uh, these kind of how these experiences can inform our path forward. Um, so we will uh, just want to remind everyone that we will adhere strictly to the times on the on the agenda. So we will uh, have uh, the time uh, for the speakers. Uh, left up front, so keep an eye on, on the front corner here uh, for your time. And for the audience, please save your questions for the Q and answer, question and answer session uh, following the end of each set of uh, spe speakers. Um, so finally, I want to just thank uh, Mark Hurlbert and Suzanne Tapalian, my co-chairs for this workshop, as well as the MRA for all of their support, and everyone uh, in the um, academic uh, community and the uh, industry community who has agreed to participate in this and help uh, carry this discussion forward, so thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Michael Kaplan. I serve as president and CEO for the Melanoma Research Alliance. I'm going to take just a few seconds to explain MRA and who we are. Uh, for those interested, our website's uh, curemelanoma.org. We were founded in 2007 by Deborah and Leon Black with a goal to end suffering and death due to melanoma and to really accelerate the research. Uh, since our first grant in 2008, we've granted $110 million out to well over 100 institutions across 18 countries. 90% of that has been focused on treatment. And I think everyone in the field has excited by watching how far we have moved in treatment. Uh, we've started to also up our lift in MRA on what we can be doing about early detection as well. Um, we are, uh, if you're ever interested in looking at the portfolio of what MRA funds, go to uh, caremelanoma.org backslash grants, um, and I think the rest of the info about us is there. I'll say we're delighted to be working with the FDA on this workshop. As Ashley mentioned, this came out of the industry roundtable breakfast that we do each year at our scientific retreat, which is done in thanks and in sponsorship with much of industry. Um, I want to... Uh, Make clear, this is, this is really an exciting time in melanoma. Uh, I worked uh, prior to MRA three and a half years ago. I worked in HIV for 24 years uh, and saw a lot of radical change and feel like I'm reliving that life in terms of the number of new treatments coming on, the combinations of treatments, and now the concept of how much earlier can we get to treatment and making a real impact. So I'm very excited to be able to have this gathering that has academics, has industry, has government, all together with patients to talk about what does the path forward look like. I need to make clear that uh, much of this meeting is made possible through sponsorship. While sponsors have no role in the content of the meeting and de in designating speakers, they are the ones who allow the people here in person to enjoy coffee and a few baked goods, and the ones who made it possible for it to be streamed for the ones who are watching it on webcast. So a thank you 
to Amgen, BMS, Merck, Novartis, and Oncosec. And as I mentioned, this is being webcast. There's uh, over about 150 registered for the webcast. So as you have questions today, please note, no one will hear it outside this room if you do it without a microphone. So please wait for a microphone to come to you. Um, I think the last thing I had to do was to invite Suzanne Topalian to do the opening keynote. Uh, I'll do a little bit of just mention in terms of how we know Suzanne. I, I think everyone knows Suzanne and her bio is in the book. Uh, she's professor of surgery and oncology at Johns Hopkins University, associate director of Hopkins Bloomberg Kimmo Institute for Cancer Immunotherapy. Uh, and we're thrilled that she is uh, our first chief science officer to help get MRA started way back when, but continues her involvement as a member of the MRA board of directors and as the chair of the scientific advisory panel. So please offer Dr. Suzanne Topelian a warm welcome. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, I realize uh, that there are people from many backgrounds here, and some of you are not melanoma specialists. So uh, what we thought we would do with, with the first lecture this morning is, is just bring everybody up to speed on the, the background of um, all, uh, therapies that are already approved uh, for patients with melanoma, and then um, the scientific rationale behind neoadjuvant approaches and, and where we think we can uh, go with this. Okay, so already I, there, oops, okay, hang on. Okay, my disclosures for the talk are here. All right, so um, the first, uh, let's talk about uh, unresectable uh, stage four metastatic melanoma and how far we've come. And I'm comparing where we are today to where we were in 2007 when the Melanoma Research Alliance was actually founded. Uh, so in 2007, uh, we had limited options and clinical trial, uh, according to NCCN guidelines, was actually the premier option uh, for patients with stage four. Uh, we had chemotherapies that didn't work very well. We had high-dose IL-2 uh, that helped about 12 to 15 percent of patients, uh, but was very toxic and required uh, often intensive care unit uh, uh, monitoring. And we had chemoimmunotherapy, again, very toxic and eventually not uh, found to be uh, superior to its uh, components. And finally, there was best supportive uh, care. So where are we today? Well, it's a much longer list. Uh, certainly clinical trial always remains on the list as an option, uh, but now <clears throat> we have two different anti-PD-1 drugs. In fact, these were the very first anti-PD-1 uh, approvals in any cancer in 2014. Um, we have combination immunotherapy. We have three different BRAF MEK inhibitor uh, combinations that are FDA approved. Um, we have anti-CTLA-4 ip ipilimumab uh, as monotherapy. Um, high dose IL-2 is still on the list, but very rarely used these days, um, and, and other uh, options which are not very often used. Uh, and so you can see that we've come um, quite a long way. Um, Com uh, let's compare uh, the expected survival of a patient with advanced uh, metastatic melanoma uh, 10 years ago to where we are today. Uh, so this is the iconic CORN uh, trial uh, meta-analysis of over 2,000 patients with melanoma uh, enrolled on 42 phase two cooperative group uh, trials. Uh, and the conclusion of the authors was that new agents are needed uh, for metastatic melanoma because there's no evidence of survival survival prolongation with existing therapies. Uh, at that time, the median overall survival for stage four melanoma was only six months, and the one-year overall survival was 26%. And I'll draw your attention to the three-year survival on this graph, which is in single digits. 
So now if you compare that um, to trials that came later, uh, as you know, ipilimumab anti-CTLA-4 was the first drug uh, of any kind shown to improve overall survival in unresectable melanoma. And now we've gone from single-digit survival at uh, three years uh, to survival of about 20%. Uh, so that was quite an improvement. Um, then we continued to move forward, and this is uh, the experience with uh, targeted therapy with BRAF MEC uh, combination therapy. Now at three years, uh, we're almost at 40% overall survival. And then when we look at um, one of the modern immunotherapy trials, uh, this is from the three-arm uh, trial of uh, NEVO plus IPI versus NEVO alone or IPI alone, you can see that the two arms that included nivolumab anti-PD-1 uh, have a three-year survival that's exceeding 50%. So um, that's a tenfold increase in, in overall survival uh, in a decade. Um, and that has been very exciting. Um, we learned with uh, kinase inhibitors as well as the immunotherapies that there were side effects, but they could usually be managed if recognized early and, and treated aggressively. And so um, this then provided um, a, a good platform to ask, could we use the same treatments earlier in the course of melanoma uh, would they be effective um, in uh, prolonging relapse-free and overall survival in patients who had resectable melanoma? Um, so again, let's look back to 2007. And where were we uh, for patients with stage three? Uh, so this is local regional lymph node um, spread, stage three metastatic melanoma. Well, in 2007, uh, everybody was required to have a complete lymph node dissection. Um, including the patients who had microscopic disease on sentinel lymph node biopsy. Um, the first option for these patients, according to NCCN, again, was clinical trial. Um, Interferon alpha was FDA approved, um, but uh, was uh, shown to have a, a benefit for relapse free, uh, but not for overall uh, survival. Um, and observation uh, was uh, something that we discussed with patients often because it wasn't uh, clear that the other options uh, would be any better than um, observation. So now in 2019, we're at a very different place. Um, complete lymph node dissection is no longer required uh, for positive sentinel lymph node biopsy, and, and this was uh, shown in a randomized trial uh, not to improve uh, survival. Um, and you see uh, on the, the left un under the photo there uh, quotes from Lex Egermont and Lynn Schuchter in 2017 where some landmark uh, trials uh, were published uh, showing that we we could use uh, anti-PD-1 drugs or kinase inhibitors um, and prolong relapse-free survival in operated uh, patients. Uh, and so the quotes uh, that that was a complete overhaul and head-spinning progress, I think, are very accurate. So in 2019, um, we now have two different anti-PD-1 drugs that are FDA-approved uh, in the adjuvant setting, uh, as well as uh, a BRAF-MEC combination. Clinical trial is still Still always an option, um, and observation is an option, but uh, not one that I think we often use these days be because we have these other um, things to offer. Um, here are the results from uh, the BRAF MEC inhibitor trial that, that led to the FDA approval. Um, this trial actually uh, showed. Um, and a benefit for overall as well as recurrence-free uh, survival compared to patients who received placebo. And you can see there uh, the Kaplan-Meier curve um, at three years uh, showing a highly significant difference in the, in the two uh, arms. Um, here's the trial that led to approval of nivolumab anti-PD-1 in the adjuvant uh, setting. Um, this trial included not only patients with stage 3 local regional metastases, but also patients with resectable stage 4 disease. Uh, almost 1,000 patients um, in this trial randomized either to receive anti-PD-1 or anti-CTLA-4, which was um, previously approved for this indication, but you can see uh, the advantage to 
the anti-PD-1 as well as the advantage in having far fewer uh, side effects. Um, this trial looked at recurrence-free uh, survival. And then uh, for pembrolizumab, um, we have a trial comparing pembro to placebo, uh, looking at recurrence-free survival. And, and you see, again, the Kaplan-Meier curves uh, separating fairly early um, with uh, a definite uh, improvement in relapse-free survival at 12 months. So now the question for today is, can we further improve on patient outcomes uh, by applying a neoadjuvant or pre-surgical approach in patients with high-risk resectable melanoma? So there are potential advantages uh, to applying these therapies in the neoadjuvant setting uh, compared to treating advanced unresectable melanoma. Um, we have a lower baseline tumor burden to deal with because you would be um, uh, dealing with uh, localized resectable uh, disease. And uh, because the patients would not have received other systemic cancer therapies before, um, they will all have an intact immune system, uh, which is important when considering neoadjuvant immunotherapies. Um, now, what's the evidence that it's better to have a lower disease burden when, when you receive uh, immunotherapy in, in this example? I mean, it makes sense that that might be true, but we actually have evidence to support this. And so this is one um, trial. This is um, this, the CA20903 trial uh, of nivolumab in five different cancer types. It was one of the earliest uh, anti-PD-1 uh, trials. Uh, enrollment started in 2008. And now um, we have over five year uh, observation on, on these uh, patients. So looking here at the, um, the patients who were alive five years after starting anti-PD-1 therapy and looking at their tumor burden compared to the patients who were not alive, you can see that there's a significant difference um, in these groups. So this is just one example showing that it is better to have a lower tumor burden, um, at least for patients with advanced uh, disease going, going on to immunotherapy. And um, likewise, in, in the study that was published earlier this year, um, we looked at the baseline absolute lymphocyte count, which is a, a general uh, assessment of, of immune status in these patients um, when they went on the trial, um, and showed that uh, tumor regression as well as five-year overall survival in the 003 trial significantly correlated with a higher baseline absolute lymphocyte count. Um, so um, it is better for immunotherapy to have an intact immune system uh, when you begin to receive the drugs. Now, there are special clinical trial considerations that we're going to talk about a lot in, in uh, the lectures uh, that you'll hear today. Um, what are the risks of neoadjuvant therapy? Um, well, during the neoadjuvant treatment period, if the patient's tumor does not respond to the treatment and progresses, then you may lose a surgical option. Uh, so that's always something to keep in mind. And um, uh, also, if the patient develops adverse events during this treatment period, uh, this can cause additional surgical uh, delay. Um, but the benefits, um, if the trials are designed correctly, should outweigh the risks. The potential benefits are that if the treatment is successful, um, the tumor reduction that occurs before surgery might make it easier to do surgery. And some people have even suggested that maybe we don't have to do surgery at all. Uh, so uh, we also have another um, biomarker uh, at play, which is pathologic response. Uh, uh, which may be a surrogate marker for relapse-free and overall survival in these patients. Um, and finally, for those of us who do translational research, um, we now have adequate tissues in the surgical specimens uh, for in-depth biomarker studies. Uh, you all know that most of the biomarker work uh, in developing uh, these drugs for melanoma has been done with core needle biopsies uh, with all the, the flaws of, of that approach, uh, but now we have entire uh, tumor specimens uh, to work with, in, including live uh, cells um, for our studies.
Uh, we'll hear today about some of the surgical issues, and because my background is in surgical oncology, I just thought I would mention a few of them uh, now. Um, Surgeons are very important partners in neoadjuvant uh, trials. Um, it has to be determined what is a safe preoperative neoadjuvant treatment interval. Um, and this uh, may differ uh, among different disease types. And, and you're going to hear uh, now from about uh, breast cancer neoadjuvant approaches as well as lung cancer. And those are very different scenarios in terms of what the safe preoperative treatment period might be. Um, if the neoadjuvant treatment is successful, uh, the regressed tumors may be very difficult to locate uh, by the surgeon for resection. And so it's been suggested that maybe we need to mark these tumors with uh, uh, clips, uh, uh, you know, that can be seen on, on an x-ray or CT uh, before we start the neoadjuvant therapy. Um, in patients with regressing tumors, uh, what should be the extent of surgery? Are we going to do exactly the same surgery that we, we would have planned uh, at the outset? Um, or is this going to be overkill? Um, and is there a role for standard of care adjuvant therapy after surgery uh, in melanoma? This would be TKIs or, or immunotherapy. So these are all um, issues to keep in mind uh, as we uh, go through the discussions today. Now, there are special um, mechanism of action considerations, I think, for neoadjuvant immunotherapy. And so I would just like to uh, talk a little bit about that. Um, as immunologists, we consider neoadjuvant therapies as a primer uh, for systemic anti-tumor immune responses. And uh, in, in this uh, diagram uh, on the left, you see that a tumor that's infiltrated by the T cells and uh, the small blue cells. And um, uh, at the baseline, those T cells are being turned off because they express the PD-1 co-receptor, and that is um, interacting with the PD-L1 ligand on, on tumor cells and, and other infiltrating cells in the tumor microenvironment. So after after uh, we give the uh, neoadjuvant anti-PD-1, uh, now those T cells are able to proliferate. And then they leave the tumor site, they enter the blood, and um, they circulate, seeking out sites of micrometastases, which would be uh, the reason for post-surgical relapse. Uh, these are uh, metastases that are too small to be seen on baseline uh, CT or PET scans. Now, there's an alternative model, though, um, where PD-1 blockade um, actually enhances um, the education of T cells in lymph nodes that are draining the tumor. So on the left-hand side of this diagram, uh, dendrit dendritic cells um, uh, in the tumor pick up tumor antigens and bring them to the draining lymph nodes. Um, and at that point, uh, giving anti-PD-1 or PD-L1 um, will uh, block uh, the interaction of PD-1 on the T cells with PD-L1 on the dendritic cells. And so those T cells uh, can be activated when they're educated for antigen recognition. Uh, they leave the lymph nodes, they enter the lymphatics, they get into to the blood. From that point, uh, they can traffic to the tumor site, either the macroscopic tumor that's about to be resected or the microscopic uh, tumor sites. So we don't know exactly which one of those models is, is dominant. They, they are certainly not mutually exclusive. Um, we can use murine models to try to sort out some of these issues. Um, the neoadjuvant uh, studies that have been done to date um, have um, uh, looked at this uh, 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 fairly iconic study now from Mark Smith's group in Australia that was published in 2016 in a mouse model of spontaneously metastatic breast cancer. And in this model, the authors gave immunotherapy either before surgery or after surgery. And they clearly showed, and I'm indicating in the, in the red arrows here in, in the uh, lower left, um, that overall survival in, in the 
these mice was greatly improved by giving the immunotherapy before surgery compared to after surgery. And then on the right-hand side, they also uh, showed that giving the treatment before surgery promoted a systemic immune response. And, and so those curves are showing um, the frequency of T cells uh, in the mice that recognize um, a tumor antigen. Uh, and it's only the mice uh, who received the neoadjuvant compared to the adjuvant immunotherapy that had the persistence of significant uh, of a significant frequency of these tumor uh, specific T cells. Now, that result uh, with the systemic T cell immunity was recapitulated um, in a, a human trial of neoadjuvant anti PD1 in non small cell lung cancer. And um, you're going to hear shortly from the first author of this trial, Patrick Ford. Um, but I'd like to talk about this uh, immunomonitoring work that was done in Drew Pardol's lab. Um, so, in this uh, trial, um, nivolumab anti PD1 was given for four weeks uh, before surgery for lung cancer stage one through stage three a um the tumor uh, was sub subjected to uh, whole exome sequencing, uh, so all of the uh, unique mutations in, in each patient's tumor uh, were known. Uh, peptides were synthesized uh, uh, representing epitopes, uh, potential antigens, uh, uh, including those mutations. Uh, blood from the patient was stimulated with pools of peptides, and here you can see in this single patient, of all the peptides, uh, one was recognized. And using TCR sequencing, there were three different T-cell uh, clones that recognized uh, that single uh, antigen. So then the authors could look at the surgical specimens to see if those same T-cell clones, now recognizing a known mutant tumor antigen, could also be found in the surgical specimen. Um, they looked at a pretreatment tumor biopsy, and that circled showing that there, those three clones were represented at a very high frequency in the pretreatment tumor. And then um, there are three other samples shown there, normal lung at the time of resection, uh, where the frequency was not so high, but draining lymph nodes from the lung tumor uh, that did have a high frequency of the same uh, T cells. Uh, the resected tumor itself on the far right of, of that um, graph there didn't have as many T cells, meaning that uh, comparing the pretreatment tumor to the resected tumor, uh, that it, this is it, evidence is consistent with the notion that those T cells uh, became activated after anti-PD-1 uh, treatment left the tumor uh, and circulated into the blood. And then here, uh, when uh, the, the authors looked in the blood serially uh, over time um, on nivolumab and leading up to a certain Surgery. You see the, the blue arrow on the right is, is a time point of surgery, uh, that those three T cell clones that were specific for a mutant tumor antigen um, proliferated and increased in frequency over, over time. Um, and so uh, this human evidence uh, is consistent with what I showed you from the mouse model, uh, that we may be able uh, to prime a systemic anti-tumor immunity uh, with uh, neoadjuvant uh, immunotherapy. Therapy. Now, uh, Ashley uh, mentioned that we had a uh, roundtable industry a breakfast sponsored by Melanoma Research Alliance last February, and Mark Hurlbert pu pulled together this list at that time of clinical trials uh, that were listed on the internet um, that uh, were called neoadjuvant melanoma trials. So mind you, this is, was only melanoma uh, because there are now hundreds of these trials in all different kinds of cancers, but at that time, 39 of these trials, um, which crossed the spectrum uh, of different approaches. Uh, there, um, there were intratumoral uh, uh, agents uh, being used, as well as systemic approaches, kinase inhibitors, um, immunotherapy combos, et cetera. Um, and the trials were at various stages of activity at that time. But it was interesting that almost all of these trials were investigator-sponsored trials, uh, um, meaning that they were initiated um, by academic investigators, um, and at, at that time, not so many that were initiated um, by industry or uh, cooperative uh, groups. Um, 
in the entire neoadjuvant cancer literature right now, uh, the largest number of trials in any cancer type is in melanoma. There are also publications in bladder cancer, glioblastoma. Um, but I would like to just look at these four trials that have been published in melanoma, um, uh, just to point out, uh, you know, so far what has the uh, experience been? Uh, and these are all uh, neoadjuvant immunotherapy uh, trials. Now, um, they were all investigator initiated, so you'll know, uh, know on the uh, top row uh, that the number of patients in each trial is, is fairly modest. Um, there is diversity, though, in terms of the patient eligibility. So some of them only enrolled stage three uh, disease. Others included stage four. Um, some were only for patients with lymph node um, METs and not for in-transit METs. Um, the treatment uh, periods uh, varied. On the second row there, uh, you can see that the preoperative interval varied from three weeks to two months in in these trials, um, and some of them included um, post-operative adjuvant treatment. Uh, others did not. Um, the post-operative uh, period uh, varied. Um, uh, some of them uh, focused on anti-PD-1 therapies, or others included um, a combination with IPI uh, and NEVO. And um, if you look at uh, uh, endpoints that were being measured, um, some of them um, focused on objective response rate within the neoadjuvant period. Um, and they all looked at pathologic response, but they used different criteria. So um, I'm pointing out these examples just to show the diversity of approaches in these early trials, because we'll be talking today about trying to come to more of a consensus about what should we be looking at. Um, but you'll see... Uh, um, uh, for instance, the, the uh, AMARIA trial um, only looked at pathologic complete response, um, whereas others looked at a combination of uh, complete response and major pathologic response, which means 10% uh, or less viable tumor cells remaining in the surgical specimen. And still other trials added this category of partial pathologic response, which is 50% or less viable tumor cells uh, um, remaining. One thing that we did learn from these trials uh, was that certain combinations of IPI and NEVO were, were far too toxic, uh, and especially in the neoadjuvant uh, setting where some of these patients, um, we know from AJCC experience, would have been uh, cured by surgery alone. So this is really the, the risk-benefit uh, equation that we need to, to uh, look at. Um, the trial by Wang uh, et al., um, uh, using anti-PD-1 um, uh, had a pre-op interval of only three weeks and post-op for, for one year um, and had a reasonable pathologic um, response rate. Um, uh, the trial on the far right was a three-arm randomized trial that actually um, revealed um, a treatment method um, that had lower toxicity and still maintained a high pathologic response rates. And from that last trial, the three-arm trial, the authors uh, showed that pathologic response, now looking at complete, major, and partial pathologic response, um, did predict a longer relapse-free survival. So um, this is very encouraging uh, to suggest that pathologic response may be an early surrogate marker of longer-term clinical outcomes uh, in these patients. Now, getting back to translational research, I, I mentioned that the tissues that we get from surgical resection, which are fresh, viable tissues, offer research opportunities that we haven't had uh, with needle biopsies. Um, this is just one example. Uh, this is from Janice Taub's work, and you're going to be hearing from her uh, later uh, in the day. Um, but this is an example of, of multispectral imaging um, of a regressing uh, tumor specimen uh, showing how... Uh, um, 
uh, B cells uh, have become a very important focal point for our attention. You see in green staining there all the B cells uh, in this uh, regressing tumor specimen. And what are they doing there? Are they simply responding to uh, cytokines that the T cells in, in yellow are, are secreting? Or are they doing something more purposeful? Are, are they uh, producing immunoglobulins that are tumor specific? At this, at this point, we don't know. Um, but many of the of the features of these kinds of um, responses uh, uh, resemble wound healing, and so there are many interesting uh, paths that we can go down now with with uh, more in depth uh, biological studies. So um, for future development, and again topics uh, to consider for today. Um, TKIs and modern immunotherapies uh, provide safe and effective options for patients with melanoma in the advanced unresectable and also in the adjuvant treatment settings and should be considered now in the neoadjuvant uh, treatment setting. Risk benefit is a primary consideration for any neoadjuvant uh, therapy in operable patients who might be cured by surgery alone. Mechanism of action considerations for neoadjuvant immunotherapies versus kinase inhibitors uh, probably uh, differ, although uh, I would point that Keith Flaherty, Jen Wargo, and others have shown that certain kinase inhibitors used in melanoma also promote immunologic responses, and they may be systemic as well. Uh, so keep that in mind. Pathologic response to neoadjuvant therapy provides a, a new marker, a potential surrogate for relapse-free and overall survival. Um, and the future development of safe and effective neoadjuvant therapies in melanoma is going to require close collaboration among all of the stakeholders. This includes diverse clinical specialties as well as um, uh, people operating in different research uh, sectors. So with that, um, I'll end my talk. Uh, if I have time, I could take a question or two. Yeah. And we need a microphone past. Uh... Um, thank you, Suzanne. Um, in the studies that used anti CTLA four, were those administered systemically and at multiple doses and high dose, regular dose, mini dose? And would there, is CTLA-4 have a potential for intratumoral use in a neoadjuvant setting? So um, the people who did those studies are actually going to be discussing them in, in detail in, in the program. Uh, but it, it, some of those trials uh, used the standard uh, ipinevo combination doses that we use for advanced metastatic disease. Uh, but the three-arm trial that I mentioned at the end actually explored different dosing combinations and eventually uh, found that it was ipi one nevo 3 that had the best risk-benefit profile. Uh, Dr. Fanin, uh, my question is about the duration of neoadjuvant therapy before we do surgery. Understanding this is a systemic disease, and if we have relapse, obviously it could be you know regional or could be distant. The initial studies with interferon in Pittsburgh, we did one month uh, of induction. When we did epilimumab and then epi plus interferon and pembro plus interferon, we did six weeks. Now the SWOG study uh, 1808, and we have the ECOG study A6194. We're using nine weeks. And you know, others probably think we're, we're designing studies with 12 weeks. What's your thoughts about how long we could treat? So that's you know that's really debatable, but um, knowing that uh, at least in the advanced setting that 50 percent of patients with advanced melanoma will will have tumor regression and the other 50 percent will not, uh, to me nine weeks seems a bit long. Um, so you know I like the idea of four to six weeks. Um, that's my comfort zone, but uh, I'm sure there are other opinions and we'll hear them today. Yeah. We can only support your uh, comment on that. Um, there are data from Michelle Tang that uh, if you do it too long or too short, the efficacy of neoadjuvant therapy becomes less effective. And therefore, the UNMC advises six weeks in the, exactly in the line what you say. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sir.
Thank you, Suzanne. I'd love to invite the uh, speakers for the first session up to the join me at the table, please. So as they're walking up, I will introduce them briefly so that we can keep things moving. Um, so Dr. Uh, Angie DeMichel from UPenn will be speaking first about uh, the experience of the, in uh, new adjuvant trials in breast cancer. This will be followed by Dr. Patrick Ford from Johns Hopkins, who will discuss the lung cancer experience. Uh, then my colleague from the FDA, Lale Amiri Korstani, will discuss the FDA approach um, and perspective on new adjuvant approvals and trials. And then finally, we'll wrap up with Dr. Don Berry from um, MD Anderson, who will discuss uh, some statistical considerations. We'll save the questions, and, uh, and following all four presentations, we'll have a 15-minute uh, question and answer session. Thanks. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity to uh, join maybe I should say crash your meeting of melanoma as a breast cancer person. I think there is uh, just so much that we can learn from each other. Uh, those of us in the breast cancer world, I think are fairly in awe of the uh, progress that you have made in immunotherapy and we hope to learn from you and replicate that. And I hope that in exchange, perhaps there's something that we can share with you as well in terms of the neoadjuvant setting. Uh, and these are my disclosures. So I'm gonna to talk to you today about the iSpy platform trial. Uh, this is a trial that started about 10 years ago now, almost 10 years ago now, which uh, was really set up as a multi-center consortium to optimize therapy in early breast cancer. And I always start with the acknowledgement slide first when I give a talk about iSpy rather than at the end, because I think it's really telling to show you the enormous number of people it takes to run this. The overall PIs of the trial are Laura Esserman and Don Barry, who joins me on the panel today. Uh, but there are also discrete working groups. Uh, I chair the operations working group, but there are working groups for the different agents that we're testing for safety, biomarkers, imaging, pathology, et cetera. And that has really enabled us to push development in each of these areas and work as a team. And so the leadership of this trial has really been spread out over uh, all over the country. Uh, we currently have 19 sites. We're adding sites all of the time. Uh, and then we are um, also sponsored by a group called Quantum Leap Healthcare Collaborative. But I want to just also point out that the initial sponsorship of this was from the um, the Biomarkers Consortium of the Foundation of the NIH. And without the FNIH, this trial would not exist. And I think this is a, really a tribute to um, uh, too many in uh, the national sphere who recognized that the time was right for a trial like this. And you can see some of the names there, Anna Barker, Gary Kelloff, Janet Woodcock, Rick Pazder, who all were very, very supportive of this. And so we have had from the very beginning a really great working relationship with the FDA in terms of thinking about how to design this trial in a way that would maximize the information and the opportunity to get new drugs uh, to our patients as quickly as possible. So we really developed this because we were at an inflection point. We had gotten to the point where we knew that breast cancer had evolved from one disease to many. We had these molecular biomarkers that would help us understand who was at risk for early recurrence versus late recurrence. We understood how to characterize patients with different molecular subtypes of the disease. And so we could understand a lot about a patient at the time of diagnosis in terms of their risk and what they might respond to. Uh, we also had developed a situation where we had really two different groups of patients, those who had been identified through screening uh, with very early stage disease who are, have very specific needs where we need to de-escalate therapy and not uh, cause a lot of toxicity. But we, even with the um, early screening, still had this population of patients who were presenting at later stage disease with interval cancers, very aggressive phenotypes where we knew that we needed to do something because these patients were destined to go on to relapse. And then finally, 
we had been a field of large adjuvant trials for several decades. And most of the things that we had learned in breast cancer about how to treat patients and improve our cure rate came from these several thousand patient adjuvant trials in the surgical area, radiation oncology area, and then in the chemotherapy area. And you know, even when you think about some of the HER2 positive trials that have led to drug approvals, those trials were in the range of eight to 10,000 patients. And we had gotten to a point recognizing that those days were really pretty much over, that we, number one, we're not going to be able to afford to do those trials. We're not going to be able to afford to wait for the outcomes of those trials. And that one size fits all approach just didn't make sense anymore with the, what we knew about the disease. So it was time to change what we were doing and how we were doing it. And so as in all diseases, our typical drug development approach had been to start in the metastatic setting, to start with phase two studies, to look for a signal, usually in very heavily pretreated patients, and then to bring those forward from the metastatic setting into the adjuvant setting. And as you can see here, that would lead to you know, 12 to 14 years before, at the earliest, before a drug could get approval. So the other, of course, advantage of neoadjuvant uh, drug development was being able to bring these drugs up front and really compress that timeline. And I think that was also one of the driving forces. It, we had a plethora of new drugs. We needed a way to figure out how to find those that had a signal. And we couldn't afford to invest in one at a time and wait 12 to 14 years to see if something was going to work. So this was a way really for signal finding to really set up a platform where we could really address a lot of different drugs in a short period of time. And, uh, and then also to do it in a way that would set the active drugs up for then phase three validation that could lead to their approvals. And so our ultimate goals were to really improve the efficiency of testing these new agents. We developed a platform trial because we wanted to test agents across a variety of different companies, and we needed a way to standardize what we did. We did not want to start a new trial every time we wanted to test a new agent. So we needed to come up with a way in which we could be testing drugs simultaneously and serially over time. And that's what a platform trial allowed us to do. Adaptive randomization, as Don's going to tell you, was really um, incredibly important because of the efficiency and because it really enabled us to say, we are actually utilizing this study design to make sure we are getting the most effective patient, uh, the most effective drugs to the patients, and we are minimizing the exposure of toxic, ineffective therapies to patients in this early setting. And then, of course, testing against common controls and historical controls has been a challenge, but it's incredibly important because uh, you need to have uh, the ability to look over time at how different drugs are doing against a standard, and often that standard is changing. And so that has been a particular challenge of doing this type of a platform trial, but I think one that we have been able to overcome through a variety of uh, methods to be able to utilize all of the data uh, that we've gathered from the beginning. And because we do have very set standards in the way that we have collected our biomarkers and the way in which we have collected our endpoints in our eligibility criteria, this has created a standardization and consistency over time that has enabled us to be able to then combine that data in ways that we couldn't, uh, to, to address questions we couldn't have ad uh, addressed with any one arm alone. And in the process, I will say that what has happened in the course of this trial is that new adjuvant therapy changed, clinical care changed at the sites that adopted the trial, that it became the culture to do neoadjuvant therapy. And the methods that we were using began to spill out into how we, patients were being treated with neoadjuvant therapy off the trial. And I think in that sense, something like this can elevate all boats and make therapy better for patients overall, uh, simply because one develops a standardized approach to giving this kind of therapy. So just a few words about the design. I wanted to just show you our eligibility and how we get patients to the starting line. And I think it's really important to recognize that we have incorporated 
not just standard receptors like estrogen receptor and HER2 receptor tumor size as a minimum for patients that would come into the trial, but we've also incorporated a molecular assay. So the mammaprint assay was utilized to identify those patients who were really low in terms of their molecular risk, even though they may have looked high in terms of their clinical risk, because we knew that those patients really did not have the early recurrence risk that we needed in order to be able to see the events. And in fact, it would be wrong to expose those patients to investigational therapies because overall they had a good prognosis. So incorporating a molecular tool into this trial under an IDE really made it possible for us to really hone in on the right patient population. Patients who then are deemed eligible go into the adaptive randomization, and this is the you know, most oversimplification ever because as you can imagine, there are many arms to the trial going on, but essentially we break it down by HER2 status. Uh, so HER2 positive patients, because of their biology, because of the nature of the agents that we have to test, are stratified into one group and HER2 negative patients into another. But ideally, we like to be able to test drugs across all of our signatures. That is where the power comes in. And with the adaptive approach, we can learn which areas, which subtypes uh, this drug will be most effective. But in terms of the controls, we typically will use HER2 status as the way in which to do our comparisons. So then you see our interval, which I know is a major issue. Uh, and we have 12 weeks of investigational therapy followed by another eight to 12 weeks of standard therapy. We uh, collect um, imaging, biopsies, blood along the way and use those for the biomarker work. Imaging has been very important because it's enabled us to incorporate response along the way. Another important issue is the endpoint. And uh, as Suzanne mentioned earlier, it is incredibly important to standardize the endpoint. And it's not just important to standardize the definition, but it's important to standardize how you get there. And we have used the assessment uh, called residual cancer burden and trained all of our sites in the way in which to do this so that they're actually processing the specimens the same way. And what you can see along the right side there is the high correlation between central and local review of these. We have multiple areas of biomarkers, so biomarkers play a large role here in helping us not just to understand which patients will respond, but what are the biological characteristics that could enable us to, um, to identify the right patient for the right drug. And in the interest of time, I'm not gonna go into incredible detail on the remaining slides, these are available to you, and I'm happy to answer questions. We could talk all day about iSpy. But I want to give you just a flavor of what we're doing. So here are all the drugs that we have tested. Those in blue have graduated, essentially been found to meet the criteria for an active drug. Those in green did not meet that criteria. And we put a cap on how many patients could go into an arm before we just, you know, ultimately said, OK, this isn't ultimately going to graduate. You see that we have a range of different kinds of drugs from monoclonal antibodies, small molecule inhibitors, and then immunotherapy, which really in purple are the, has been the more recent group of drugs. And we did have one drug that dropped out for, futi for uh, toxicity. And safety, of course, is a major issue here when you are investigating drugs um, in patients who are potentially curable. And we have a safety group that monitors everything we do. And so we've had various drugs that have graduated, and you see there by these different groups, and we're not comparing across, but that some drugs do ultimately rise to the top. Pembrolizumab, of course, really was one of our major winners, and it was a winner in hormone receptor positive disease, um, as well as hormone receptor negative disease. And um, in the HER2 positive space, we've had many win winners. Um, and so I think that these have been opportunities for us to learn, particularly with Prembro. And I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about that, but the institution of immunotherapy into this platform was somewhat tricky. We learned a lot from you in terms of what to look for. Then finally, I want to just say that when you've done this on a platform, you will have the opportunity then to combine all of the different arms to answer questions that are bigger than any one arm alone could. 
And so what we did uh, over the past couple of years has been to combine all of our data to be able to look at the surrogate pathologic complete response and our secondary surrogate residual cancer burden as an individual predictor of distant relapse-free survival and event-free survival. And so what you see on the left are patients in blue who've had a pathologic complete response, patients in red who have not. This is 1,265 women years, okay? So this is really the accumulated experience of the platform, enabling us, because of the standardization of procedures, to combine this data in a way that could help us assess the surrogate. And what you see is really this amazing separation in terms of whether PCR was a predictor or not. And I think this was certainly something that we thought would be the case, but validating that within a prospective trial had not really been done in this way where we had standardization of endpoints. I think this is also very interesting. So if you look at on the left side, event-free survival in the patients who've had a pathologic complete response, regardless of the kind of breast cancer they had, those women did exceptionally well. Getting a pathologic complete response was a very good prognostic indicator. And yet on the right, if you did not, you see that splay of different subtypes. And that then starts to help us figure out who do we need to focus on in terms of the non-responders and how can we move patients from one curve to the other. This just shows you that we really weren't powered to answer the EFS question for any one drug. It was really the power of pulling all of the drugs together that enabled us to answer this. And these uh, event-free survivor hazard ratios really show the strength of PCR as an endpoint for predicting event-free survival. So key lessons learned. PATH-CR is a robust early endpoint in the setting of a well-run platform trial. It's really been set up as a learning system with standards for eligibility, screening for metastatic disease, standards of pathologic assessment. It's quite a multidisciplinary endeavor. And long-term follow-up has been useful even if individual arms were not powered for that. And then finally, that achieving a PATH-CR is equally prognostic across all of the tumor subsets, which was not something that was really well understood before we started. There was some thought that perhaps in HER2-positive disease and triple-negative disease, this was a surrogate, but maybe not in ER-positive disease. And I think we now know that that is not the case. It is, in fact, across all of the patients. And so taking that information, where are we going in the future? Well, we are now... Uh, evolving the trial to something called iSpy2 Plus or 2.2. We haven't figured out what the name will be yet, but the idea here is now can we say, we know we have a surrogate for an individual patient who gets a path CR will do well. So can we evolve the trial to be designed so that the maximum number of patients will get to a path CR? We have a program project to help us develop the methodology around this. But the bottom line is that we needed to have a way to non-invasively identify the patients who were not responding, to be able to assess when to call failure and switch, to have rational selection of second-line therapy, and determine whether we could develop switching strategies that were effective. And this is just a conceptual framework showing you that this is now thinking about testing drug A in block A. If the patient doesn't respond, they get re-randomized in block B, and again in block C. So rather than just being on one path, the patient has several opportunities to achieve a complete pathologic response, and we are learning about their tumor and targeting to their tumor along the way. And this, I think, is really where we're gonna find the most power in terms of this approach to benefiting individual patients and testing drugs as we go along, including the fact that we can uh, target individual tumors with the molecular profiles. And so this is an evolving platform. This is a living, breathing thing. I think this is something we are continuing to learn from, and I'm excited to see what you all will be able to teach us about this in your field as well. Thank you very much, and I'll wait for questions. Falls off the stage. It's a tight event. <laughs>
Hi, everyone. Um, uh, so I'm Patrick Ford. I'm a medical oncologist at Johns Hopkins in the lung cancer program. Um, I'll just see if my slides are coming up. And these are my disclosures. And I'm going to talk a little bit today about our experience with neoadjuvant immunotherapy for lung cancer. I've, uh, we've worked very closely with Suzanne on this, so she mentioned a little bit of the data earlier. Um, I'll, I'll expand a little bit on that. Um, so in contrast to breast cancer, I think uh, we've been kind of a more recent comer to the neoadjuvant um, space. Uh, um, however, there's been an explosion in the last couple of years, really, in neoadjuvant trials in lung cancer. Um, so Suzanne mentioned a little bit about, about, about doing a clinicaltrials.gov search earlier on. Um, I had a look a couple of weeks ago, and there are 162 neoadjuvant PD-1 or PD-L1 um, based trials across solid tumors. And in lung cancer specifically at the moment, I was able to find 56 trials which are either planned or recruiting listed on ct.gov, which involve neoadjuvant immunotherapy. About half of those trials are purely neoadjuvant, the other half of both neoadjuvant and post-operative therapy. I'm pretty much sure I didn't look three years ago, but I'm pretty much sure if you did, um, that number would have been in the single digits. So it's a very much an exploding field at the moment. Um, so to talk a little bit about where we are with lung cancer and where we've been, unfortunately, for the last 15 or 16 years. Um, for early stage disease, it's got one of the worst prognosis, really, for, uh, for a common um, resectable cancer. With stage one disease, uh, which are generally tumors which don't involve the lymph nodes, but the prognosis is still not very good. Uh, median um, survivals of just over um, five years and five year survivals ranging from 77% to 92%. When you move up in stage, and these are patients who have just one or more hilar lymph nodes involved or have slightly larger tumors, the prognosis drops and almost half of those patients will experience relapse and eventual death after surgery. And then in stage 3A disease, which is a kind of a, um, it's a very mixed bag in terms of lung cancer. There are multiple different approaches can be taken to treating this stage of disease. These are patients who have mediastinal lymph node involvement. The prognosis is approximately two thirds of patients will experience relapse of their cancer after definitive treatment. And there are multiple different approaches taken. Um, the NCCN guidelines would uh, permit use of preoperative chemotherapy alone, uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy, neoadjuvant chemoradiation, or definitive chemoradiation, so no surgery. And all of those are considered reasonable options. Here in the United States, um, the approach is largely institution and provider dependent. In other parts of the world, in Europe, for example, um, chemotherapy is, is used most commonly as neoadjuvant therapy. Uh, neoadjuvant treatment for stage 3A. And then when you move one further stage up, so these are patients with um, supraclavicular nodal involvement or contralateral mediastinal involvement. These cases are not considered surgical cases and are treated with definitive chemoradiation. But I think if you look at the numbers on the right side of the, uh, on the screen, how we, how we really do need to improve outcomes for these patients. In terms of the historic perspective on neoadjuvant or adjuvant therapy in lung cancer, um, through the 1990s and 2000s, um, there were many large, uh, similar to uh, what Dr. De Michele, um described in breast cancer, there were very large adjuvant trials conducted in Europe, the US, uh, Canada. Um, the largest trials were listed in this meta-analysis published in 2008, and this showed uh, after enrolling close to 20,000 patients, uh, there was a 5% benefit in survival at five years for four cycles of, um, of adjuvant cisplatin-based chemotherapy. Interestingly, you'll see um, there was a lung cancer-specific improvement in survival of 6.9%, uh, but an actual reduction in non-cancer-related death. And this kind of uh, tells us something about the population of patients, a median age of 70, um, significant comorbidities. So chemotherapy is not easy for these patients. At the same, at the same time, multiple neoadjuvant studies were ongoing, uh, and many of these were still um, accruing at the time the adjuvant data started to be published. However, a meta-analysis of neoadjuvant therapy suggests a similar benefit to adjuvant therapy. Uh, these uh, patients in the neoadjuvant setting in lung cancer generally get more chemotherapy, um, and a small percentage uh, do not progress to surgery, about 5% uh, because of progressive disease. Uh, but the benefit is similar, 5 to 10% in long-term survival. An important thing to keep in mind, though, in, in routine clinical practice in the US, um, 
only about 50% of patients actually receive um, treatment either preoperatively or postoperatively. And that's mainly because of this concern about toxicity and um, grade three, four toxicity of about 40% in patients and comorbidities in this population. But as others have mentioned, drug development in lung cancer has changed dramatically in the last few years um, from having uh, less than 100 active trials probably in all of lung cancer. Now we have thousands in rolling cohorts of patients who have lung cancer, specifically both immunotherapy and targeted therapy trials. We have multiple uh, mutational subgroups. I think we have seven different indications for drugs for targeted therapies at the moment. And this has changed how we develop drugs. Uh, the timeline from phase one to three for many of these agents has shortened down to two to three years. And then for many drugs, um, the patients may have been treated only five years previously when the drug is approved by the FDA. And this is highlighted by the fact in the last three years, we've had uh, 27 new um, indications for non-small cell lung cancer. And these include both approvals and new indications. But over the last 15 years, uh, we've had no changes in systemic therapy uh, for resectable lung cancer. And these um, uh, uh, patients, more than 50% of stage 2 and 3A patients will experience relapse from their cancer. So we really need to change this. Uh, what are the current approaches and barriers? I mentioned the current approaches here in the US in terms of neoadjuvant chemotherapy and chemoradiation for stage 3A. There is a significant increase in um, an increase in the levels of interest among our colleagues in, pulmono in pulmonology and surgery in neoadjuvant therapy. I looked at the agendas for all the national thoracic surgery meetings this year, and there were sessions on neoadjuvant immunotherapy specifically um, highlighted at each of those meetings. And that's very important. I think if you work in this field, it's a very interdisciplinary um, group. Group And as um, Dr. Demichaeli mentioned, uh, so it takes a whole team of, of different investigators and patients uh, to move these trials forward. In lung cancer specifically, almost all early stage patients are seen by surgeons. They have to be um, integrated into the field and be comfortable in resecting these patients' tumors after neoadjuvant therapy. And why uh, would neoadjuvant make sense in our disease, at least? Um, so one of the major um, issues we've had is that the median time from enrollment of the first patient uh, um, to an adjuvant uh, lung cancer trial, those five trials I highlighted, um, to the publication of those results over the period of 1990 to uh, 2016 was 11 years. And when you're looking at hundreds of new agents being developed and providing some benefit for metastatic uh, disease patients, um, it's just not practical to continue to have that timeline um, for bringing these uh, drugs forward to patients with potentially curable disease and increasing that cure rate. The other problem we've had with many of the adjuvant trials in lung cancer, and this may apply to other um, diseases as well, is that there's been relatively modest uh, correlative science performed in these trials. So we see toxicity rates with chemotherapy of 40 to 50 percent, but we don't know who that 5 uh, percent benefit in terms of survival really applies to. Um, other than standard pathologic criteria or clinical staging. Um, you'll hear, I think, some more later on from Dr. Janice Taub and colleagues about pathologic response assessment in melanoma and lung cancer. Um, for the reason I said, uh, this 11-year time lag to results from adjuvant trials, we have been working a lot in the last couple of years, including in collaboration with the FDA and the International Association of the Study of Lung Cancer, um, on uh, potential novel endpoints for neoadjuvant studies in lung cancer. Um, we're taking our lead here from the breast cancer neoadjuvant studies. Um, however, pathologic complete response has been historically very rare after chemotherapy in lung cancer. About 5% of patients um, experience a pathologic complete response after neoadjuvant chemotherapy alone. Major pathologic response has been proposed in lung cancer as a potential surrogate because it's more common. This um, essentially is less than 10% or, or less residual viable tumor in the primary tumor alone after neoadjuvant uh, therapy. And it occurs about 20% of the time with chemotherapy. Retrospective analysis of two large um, cohorts suggested it does correlate well with long-term disease-free survival. Uh, however, these analyses to date are retrospective. And you can see the hazard ratios range from 2.5 um, up to 4.8, depending on the degree of residual tumor uh, post-neoadjuvant chemo. 
The other important point is this, um, this assessment has been after chemotherapy alone. And it's quite possible um, the response may differ in patients who receive immunotherapy-based treatments. I'll mention briefly our experience with neoadjuvant nivolumab in lung cancer. Um, we published this last year, including with Dr. Tapalian and others. And essentially, uh, this was a window of opportunity study giving um, two doses of nivolumab over four weeks prior to surgery for stage 1b to 3a lung cancer. We were mainly focused on translational signs. However, uh, we were surprised to find that many of these patients had either pathologic complete responses or major pathologic responses. 45% uh, of patients had this major pathologic response, uh, less than 10% residual tumor. And we recently looked at long-term follow-up on these patients. You'll see in the blue, so on the right of your screen in the blue, where those patients who had a major pathologic response. Again, very small numbers. However, only one of those patients has had a recurrence of his tumor to date. And he actually had definitive therapy uh, for that recurrence with chemoradiation and has no... Uh, has no further recurrence. You see in the lower part of the screen in red, uh, many of the patients, unfortunately, who did not have a major pathologic response have recurred. Very small data set. However, hopefully this will be uh, validated going forward uh, with large trials which are ongoing. These studies offer uh, many opportunities for interdisciplinary correlative science. Um, I sometimes joke that this is the most heavily um, analyzed 20 patient cohort <laughs> in history, um, but these are some of the, the studies which have been published from this cohort looking at, as Dr. Taub and Dr. Cottrell will talk about immune-related pathologic response and reproducibility. Uh, most recently, compartmental analysis of the T-cell repertoire and the periphery and in the tumor and normal lung. Dr. Anagnostu, one of our colleagues in genomics, has very nicely described how you can assess um, circulating tumor DNA after four weeks of therapy preoperatively. And that appears to predict pathologic response better than radiology. Um, finally, we have our, our colleagues in surgery, as I said, have become interested in this area. And there have been multiple um, sessions at meetings and other fora um, discussing the neoadjuvant PD-1 blockade. And Dr. Broderick from our hospital um, published recently on surgical outcomes, and a volume of alone appears to be very well tolerated surgically. So looking at other studies, um, so as I said, often the first uh, report has a higher um, uh, benefit rate. However, two other studies have been reported to date, uh, one looking at nivolumab alone, another combination immune checkpoint blockade. The other study looked at a tezolizumab given for three doses prior to surgery. Um, and the pathologic response rates have been, uh, so in the region, of, uh, for, of 20 percent um, higher with nivolumab and ipilimumab, however, more significant toxicity and some delays to surgery with the combination. Putting them all together, um, uh, the dreaded cross-trial comparison, but 23.7 percent of patients appeared to derive a major pathologic response from neoadjuvant immunotherapy alone. This compares favorably uh, with the major pathologic response with chemotherapy. I think that what's building in our field is enthusiasm for chemoimmunotherapy, and this is approved for um, metastatic lung cancer, and it's, it's one of the standard first-line treatments for metastatic and non-small cell lung cancer. This study by Dr. Uh, Provencio in Spain has recently been reported. Um, he gave, it was a very pragmatic study with not a very high translational component, however, um, the trade-off of rapid accrual. And this uh, study gave three cycles of chemotherapy, standard neoadjuvant therapy with um, nivolumab anti-PD-1, and assessed pathologic response. And these data are quite striking. Um, so I mentioned the historic rate of pathologic complete response in lung cancer with chemo is 5%. He reports 61% um, pathologic complete response rate. Um, he also recently reported um, two-year follow-up on this study for patients on study, and 96% of patients are still alive with 87% uh, progression-free. Now, a single-arm study, it's hard to extrapolate, but you would have expected far more than 50% of those patients to have recurred at this point. Um, so, so I think the iSPY study is the paradigm that many of us are following, and this is a study which is recently underway looking at, um, it's a platform, essentially. Um, Relatively pragmatic, however, randomizing patients to either a control arm of dorvalumab uh, given for one dose prior to surgery over one month, um, or one of a number of combinations uh, looking at novel agents. Um, and this is intended to, uh, to try and replicate some of the work being done in the breast cancer world in our field 
and evaluate novel combinations at an early point. The primary endpoint for this study is major pathologic response with a very heavy translational um, a component looking at uh, um, exome sequencing, a single cell RNA sequencing, and other platforms. Finally, at Hopkins, we've been working um, kind of with a number of institutions, and you'll find, as, as mentioned in the breast cancer world, when you become interested in neoadjuvant therapy, it rapidly spirals. And now I would say the vast majority of our patients go on neoadjuvant immunotherapy trials. This is a trial sponsored by Stand Up to Cancer and Longevity, where we're giving um, different combinations of immunotherapy prior to surgery and focusing very much on obtaining adequate um, tissue specimens and blood specimens for translational science. And this has been ongoing and accruing well at our institution. And we have recently joined with other institutions at, at uh, McGill in Canada and the Swedish Cancer Institute and Memorial Sloan Kettering to expand this study. So finally, um, I think in terms of neoadjuvant immunotherapy trials, and they have the potential to dramatically accelerate drug development for early stage disease and also for, uh, uh, for metastatic cancer. I'm using that surrogate of, of um, pathologic, uh, major pathologic response or pathologic CR. I didn't go into the late phase trials in lung cancer. However, there are a total of eight phase three trials at the moment looking at chemotherapy and immunotherapy given neoadjuvantly for lung cancer. The first of those trials recently completed accrual and has co-primary endpoints of pathologic complete response and um, uh, disease-free survival. They offer crucial insights to guide rational combination therapy. And uh, as we've seen, um, they, at the platform studies, I think, have the, uh, the opportunity to rapidly give an assessment on how um, patients' tumors respond to treatment. Uh, one, the most important point for these studies, I think, is having buy-in from a multidisciplinary team, um, surgeons, pul uh, pulmonary, uh, radiation oncology, um, explaining that uh, this will not reduce their ability to give their own therapies, uh, but may complement those therapies. And patient advocates as well, and um, patients who are newly diagnosed with a cancer. It's a very a stressful phase, and I'm um, trying to explain why neoadjuvant therapy would make sense or may make sense for patients is very important. There's huge enthusiasm in the lung cancer community for this, and I'm delighted to hear that there is um, uh, potential for collaborations with other tumor groups. Be happy to, uh, to take questions at the end. Thank you. Good morning. Um, uh, thank you for inviting me. I'm uh, actually a breast cancer um, oncologist, so I'm learning a lot from this uh, melanoma meeting. Um, so I'm here to uh, talk about our experience with the uh, new adjuvant um, platform to be used for actually the first new adjuvant approval that we had uh, for breast cancer. So in breast cancer, we actually um, had um, um, historically several randomized clinical trials that has shown that there was no significant difference in long-term outcome of patients who had received <clears throat> systemic chemotherapy either before or after surgery. And also there were uh, meta-analyses published to support this. There were some uh, favorable things regarding the use of neoadjuvant therapy for the treatment of breast cancer, which included the potential to downstage inoperable tumors, and also like potentially increase the rate of breast cancer conservation therapy, and therefore improve the surgical outcome of the patients. Um, so these were like uh, some promising um, uh, background. Uh, in addition, it was shown that achieving a pathological complete response in breast cancer actually was a very strong prognostic factor. So individual patients who had attained PCR had a very um, more favorable outcomes. Um, so using this platform to support drug approval uh, has some advantages and potentially some disadvantages. Uh, as I was mentioned, basically the endpoint is assessed right at the time of surgery so that there is a much shorter time interval to the assessment of this endpoint, which makes these trials to have much smaller sample size. 
And this is the opportunity that we could actually um, uh, approve drugs much earlier in this um, setting for patients that have um, high-risk breast cancer. On the other hand, um, since these patients are um, curable, uh, basically there is a potential that if we approve these agents first in the new adjuvant setting, then there is less safety information for these patients. Basically, we don't have much information about the long-term toxicity of the drugs. Also, we have information on less number of patients. The other issue that I think is already brought up is that pathological complete response is a binary endpoint. So there is a spectrum of how we can actually look at the response in this setting. And also, there has been no um, actually association of PCR with long-term outcome in a trial level which I'm going to um, further discuss about this. As uh, we've been actually very um, committed to expedite drug development, in 2012, um, Dr. Patricio Cortezar and um, several other colleagues at FDA, they uh, established a working group uh, to actually pool patient level um, data to look at the patient's outcomes um, from these new adjuvant trials. And um, basically, they looked at three major questions. Whether uh, from this uh, pooled analysis, they could establish if PCR is associated to long-term clinical benefit or not, and also what definition of PCR should be used for clinical trials that are going to be used as a registration trial. And also, <clears throat> what magnitude of PCR is going to be important and could uh, benefit the event-free survival or overall survival. So they did actually include 12 randomized trials. They had about 13,000 patient-level data, and they um, analyzed these. And um, they saw no association of PCR with long-term outcomes, um, basically, at the trial level. Um, they found that if uh, one was going to use a PCR um, definition when the nodes are assessed, uh, basically that was the one that was highly associated with the long-term outcome of the patients. And also in this pooled analysis, they could not find any magnitude of benefit of the PCR that could predict the long-term clinical uh, benefit in this um, pooled analysis. So they thought that there may be some reasons for this. Um, maybe actually, um, since the majority of these trials were the chemotherapy trials, there were across the board low PCR rates. Also, the population was very heterogeneous, as well as there were just few targeted therapies. Um, there was no a trial that actually had a large uh, benefit in the PCR. Or um, the other reason that actually um, they've thought that maybe really there is no association between PCR and long-term outcome in a trial level. So um, one of the thoughts is that maybe we need to see larger magnitude of benefit in PCR that could eventually translate into uh, even free survival benefit in the um, trials. At the time, actually, um, uh, Dr. Powell and Dr. Pazdur uh, published a commentary about this on the New England Journal of Medicine, as well as they published a draft guidance, because they felt even though this um, data didn't support that PCR is a validated endpoint or validated target endpoint, uh, still it could be a, a reasonably likely like an endpoint that could predict the um, clinical benefit for patients. Because for exit approval, we don't need to have a validated endpoint as long as we can uh, trust in this endpoint that it could benefit the uh, patients. And as you know, generally, exit approval needs a confirmation of benefit from other trials. So this uh, regulatory path was basically um, open, as, um, and we had actually uh, a guidance uh, that was published, and some of the key points that were uh, included in this guidance were um, the definition of the PCR that was recommended to be standardized and include the, um, the assessment of the lymph nodes, as well as um, also there were some recommendations about how to assess the pathology um, specimens. Also, pathologies need to be 
for example, um, blinded to the uh, trial, and also some trial design considerations in, were included in this guidance. Um, you can see in the right um, side figure uh, that potentially there could be two trial models that support this um, regulatory pathway. One is a single trial model that uh, basically uh, patients are enrolled in this single large uh, randomized trial and then PCR is assessed and then everybody is followed for their um, even free survival and overall survival within the same trial. And potentially, the, basically, the drug can get accelerated approval at the time of the PCR, and then uh, the conversion to a regular approval can happen uh, within the next uh, couple of years. The other model, which is called multiple trial model, is that one could just conducts a small randomized trial with the primary endpoint of PCR, and actually, then there is another uh, parallel study ongoing, for example, in adjuvant setting, which has an endpoint of even uh, like disease-free survival, basically. And then um, the PCR from the small randomized trial can be used for excerpt approval. And then the larger uh, adjuvant trial can be supportive of the conversion of the um, uh, approval to a regular approval. Um, each of these um, ha trial models have some benefits and some issues. Um, one that I can actually tell you is that the single trial model, um, there is a potential for bias after the assessment of PCR. It's because uh, patients after assessment of PCR, they may get various treatments, like they may get uh, on to and like get uh, extra chemotherapy, they may go ahead and have some radiation or no radiation or some other systemic uh, therapies that may, need, may actually affect the EFS um, actually in that trial. So even though that trial model is the best to actually show the direct association of PCR to the event-free survival, it actually um, is um, potentially um, risky path to take because there is some other risk fact, risks that actually after the PCR is uh, assessed, patients may choose to actually get uh, other standard therapies. And I'm just saying it because in breast cancer, we have actually other options available as a standard treatment for patients that don't have um, PCR or don't achieve a PCR. So uh, we actually um, had Progetta approved for metastatic breast cancer first. Um, this was um, done in 2012. This was based on Cleopatra study, which was a large randomized phase three study. It showed a, um, a strong, um, basically, PFS improvement, uh, six-month improvement. And later on, it also showed a um, significant overall survival improvement. So then on uh, the Neosphere a trial, which is a study, it was a small uh, study in new adjuvant setting, was submitted to the agency for review um, in this um, actually setting. And this uh, study actually had four arms, but the two first arms was isolating the effect of addition of progetta. And it had a, about 17 to 18% improvement in the pathological complete response rate. So, um, at the time, we knew about the results from the Cleopatra study. Obviously, that was already approved. And we knew that the drug was safe um, for patients. And they also had a confirmatory affinity study that was their adjuvant study underway, which was about like over 4,000 patients enrolled. So based on the totality of the data, we thought that this improvement in the PCR rate could potentially be reasonably likely to result in long-term um, improvement in EFS. So based on that, in 2013, we gave this first approval in breast cancer um, to Progetta, and actually that has been our only approval so far um, in this setting. Um, later in 2017, we actually saw the results of their uh, adjuvant study, 
It's very hard to see the benefit. As you can see, the Kaplan-Meier curves, this is for even um, the invasive disease-free survival. But um, study actually met the, their primary endpoint. Um, and it had some um, issues because they also had um, enrolled low-risk patient population. So that, that may have uh, resulted to the showing like a small benefit in the improvement of their um, disease-free survival results. However, because this study was positive, um, and obviously the, uh, we had a ton of safety data as well, we, um, this led to the uh, conversion uh, to the regular approval of the Pergetta. So we have some of the, um, you know, you heard about some of the issues of PCR, but more recently we have actually used it um, as a biomarker for selection to a patient or enrichment strategy. And um, more recently we had an uh, application with Catsilo or Adotrastuzumab emtansin, which was a study, Katerina study, that enrolled patients that were high risk um, as they had, they had no PCR after their regular standard chemotherapy and Herceptin, and then they were randomized to receive a standard trastuzumab or TDM1. And they had a very impressive um, results in the improvement of disease-free disease survival in this study that led to their approval. So we feel that it's an excellent, actually, biomarker for enrichment in adjuvant setting. So just um, summarize some of the trial designs that could be um, done as, uh, in terms of the uh, uh, platforms for the new adjuvant approvals. There is this one trial model that basically patients are randomized to this very large um, uh, new adjuvant study and then followed for their event-free survival and overall survival. And there is this um, multiple trial model that actually one study serves as the adjuvant study and the other one is this small randomized study that can serve for a cellular approval. And the third one on the bottom is the one that I mentioned that actually is an adjuvant study, but the lack of PCR could be a but intermediate biomarker or selection strategy that could be used to um, basically enrich the trial for patients that are very high risk at recurrence. Um, so I um, basically, um, some of the lessons that we've learned is that it's very important to have a standardized definition of um, endpoint that is gonna be used. We have used pathological complete response, but I heard that it seems like in other disease areas, um, maybe, um, um, allowing some uh, other um, partial or uh, response or something else is acceptable. However, we had um, many trials actually supported this uh, endpoint, meaning that at the time that um, the analysis was done, basically we had multiple definitions of PCR, but we had long-term actually data from the, those endpoints and the um, EFS and OS endpoints, so we could actually nicely show that which endpoint was best uh, suited for regulatory purposes. Another challenge that I mentioned was uh, is basically that when one uses a single um, trial model, because of the possibility of post-surgery therapies for patients, <coughs> Um, it's very hard to actually confirm the benefit in that setting, and it's a very risky situation because if the adjuvant trial turns out to be, well, eventually in that trial, it turns out to be negative, then that's a big issue um, for this uh, extra approval. Um, so, and um, as I mentioned more recently, um, the PCR can actually be used um, as a selection a strategy or enrichment for the adjuvant trials. And also that type of trial can be a confirmative trial for another you know, smaller new adjuvant trial. So that's all, thank you.
Hi, I'm Don Berry. Um, thanks to the organizers for inviting me. I'm a statistician. You know that statisticians tend to be pessimists. I'm one of the most optimistic of uh, uh, pessimists. Um, it's not clear whether we're born that way or selected out or, or we learn. Um, so I'm going to be talking about some of the things that Lolly uh, discussed and uh, digging in a little bit. I mean, I don't disagree with anything uh, that she said. Um, uh, next, please. Oh, I guess I do this. Somewhere in here were my disclosures. Here, um, so I'm, I'm a co-owner of Barry Consultants. Uh, uh, we design trials for pharmaceutical uh, companies and lots of other people. So Lolly talked about this uh, guidance for industry and the issue of uh, pathologic complete response was uh, a whole section um, uh, discussing it as being a potential surrogate for neoadjuvant trials and this issue of reasonably likely versus uh, validated um, uh, comes up, of course. Uh, and this is the NEO, uh, the CT NEO BC, uh, the Cortazar paper that uh, Lolly discussed, the pooled analysis led by the FDA. And uh, this, um, the, the, their findings with 12 uh, RCTs and 12,000 patients, uh, it's a little bit of a, a, a bracing thing for melanoma because you don't have things like that. Uh, you have very few uh, uh, randomized trials addressing uh, the benefits of neoadjuvant therapy. And this was one of the figures in uh, the Cortazar paper uh, showing this is the three pieces of, of breast cancer, uh, HER2 positive and then the HER2 negative broken out by triple negative, uh, hormone receptor negative, uh, and hormone receptor positive HER2 negative. Uh, the Two panels on the right, on the left, are, are the most impressive and led to the FDA uh, focusing on that as a potential uh, route for uh, accelerated approval. Uh, triple negative, for example, has a hazard ratio of PC patients who achieved PCR versus those who did not of uh, 0.24. So that's, that's huge. Um, it, it's actually small, but it's huge in terms of its impact. Um, and uh, it, it's, it leads people to say, gee, this is a surrogate. Um, it's uh, if you get a PCR, you do this uh, wonderful thing. And if you don't, it, it's not. So it ought to be uh, used for uh, regulatory things. And I've, I've attended some melanoma uh, uh, conferences where that was sort of the attitude well, I want to throw cold water on that as part of my the duty as a pessimistic uh, a statistician. Uh, it's, it's very impressive. So why isn't that enough for a validated surrogate? Um, and um, I, I, I want to dwell on this figure. So I wanted to demonstrate to you what could happen. This, what I did is I took data, real data, modified them in some ways, and uh, built a trial uh, where I had a control arm based on this historical data. And then on the, on the panel on the left, the panel A, I built a experimental therapy arm. Panel A, the experimental therapy arm, is exactly the same as the control arm, no difference. The control arm is the, the dash lines. The, um, uh, the experimental arm <clears throat> is the solid lines. And they're identical for both PCR and not. I actually had 300 patients in each group and 40% uh, uh, PCR rate in each group. So 120 patients of the 300 in both groups had a PCR. And you see what their PC, what their EFS uh, was. 
the hazard ratio in both arms for PCR versus no PCR was 0.19. And that, by the way, is uh, what uh, 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 Angie uh, presented for uh, iSpy2 for all of the patients. Um, and then I said, all right, suppose we have this therapy, this experimental therapy that benefits patients who would have been a non-PCR. So what I did was I randomly selected non-PCR patients from that were non-PCRs in the controls or in panel A in the experimental arm, and I relabeled them as PCRs. I just took a random set of non-PCRs and made them PCRs in the experimental arm. I didn't change the EFS at all. In fact, in none of these figures did I change the EFS. Um, I just relabeled uh, PCRs. Uh, so that would be like uh, a therapy that you might expect that would take patients who were not going to achieve a PCR but would achieve a PCR, not necessarily changing their EFS. It may be that you're changing the superficial disease, but you're not changing what is happening in the bone marrow, say. And the result was uh, panel B, uh, where the uh, hazard ratio, of course, in the control arm was 0.19 the hazard ratio of uh, PCR versus no PCR in the uh, experimental arm was 0.42, still very impressive. But the, has the PCR rate had increased by 20%. Lally said that you know, they didn't identify any particular number, but 20% is a pretty big number to increase the PCR rate by. And you see the results uh, where the PCRs, of course, got uh, better. Um, and so it, it, in, in the uh, uh, control arm, because you, we remove the non-PCRs from the control arm. So there's a greater spread in the control arm, even though the PCR rate increased. No benefit for the therapy. Nothing changed for EFS. So this is a bit of uh, 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 cold water uh, on your uh, thinking if you think that the uh, uh, benefit uh, uh, is indicated by simply comparing PCR with no PCR. In panel C, I said, well, suppose the, 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 uh, the I'm going to uh, change some non-controls um, the non-PCR controls who had non-events. So if the patients didn't achieve an event, maybe those patients would be exquisitely sensitive to the therapy and would show a superficial benefit, even though they weren't going to recur at all. So I changed the, a, a set of 20% um, uh, of the total, uh, 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 increasing the PCR rate. So again, I increased the PCR rate to to 60% from 40%. It looks great, um, but there's no benefit. Lally talked about the, the uh, uh, Cortazar paper, the CT Neo BC paper, um, and indicated that it uh, demonstrated that PCR was important. If you got a, if you got a PCR, it looked, you, you did very well uh, in many of the uh, subsets. Um, but then they said, if this is going to be a validated surrogate, uh, it's going to have to show that what you see in PCR translates into EFS. So the way they did that is they looked at the improvement in PCR in each of the, they had 12 studies, only uh, 10 of them were able to, they were able, able to uh, do this calculation. Um, they looked at the benefit in PCR and compared that to the benefit in EFS within each of the 10 randomized trials. 
And so what is plotted here is the odds ratio uh, in, the, in the horizontal direction of PCR versus no, PC, uh, no PCR um, versus, for treatment versus no treatment. And in the Y direction is a hazard ratio for event-free survival. And so you'd think that this would be negatively correlated. Um, and it wasn't correlated at all. I tell you, this was a, um, a, a disaster in the breast community who said now, we're not gonna be able to do what we thought we could do. We have to do these big trials. In, the, in ASCO, when George Sledge presented a discussion of a paper, he was very uh, negative about the future of, uh, of uh, the uh, uh, neoadjuvant approach. Um, if you look at, and one of the things that uh, Lolly indicated, if you look at what was the benefit, um, th there was very little benefit in any of these trials. Um, it's the odds ratio. I prefer the, the, the difference between. So uh, the, the delta for the PCR in these uh, three that looked you know, especially good uh, was only you know, 7% improvement. That's because the control arm was like 7%. So there are deficiencies and inefficiencies in the figure. For one thing, when you make one of these plots, you ignore the relationship between EFS and PCR. That's anathema uh, to my uh, view of uh, 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 inference. Um, you, you cut the link between, and you just look at the marginal rates of EFS and the marginal rates of, of PCR. And you're taking 10,000 patients and reducing them to 10 data points, losing almost all of the information, information in a very specific uh, statistical sense. And even, even identifying whether the correlation is positive or negative is very difficult when you cut that link. It may be that the patients who are living longer are those who had no PCRs, and you can't tell the difference. Uh, and if there's little treatment effect, it's difficult to show that there's a correlation based on treatment effect when there is none. Uh, and the assumption is that this requires RCTs. In my view, you don't need RCTs. You do need some sort of control. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to skip what my resolution is for figure six, because Mark just held up a sign that said five something. Uh, and I, I, I want to uh, address, so what does this mean in terms of that single trial thing that, that Lolly uh, talked about that is specified in the guidance? Well, let's, well, so let's take panel A. Remember the hazard ratio PCR, not PCR was 0.19. And let's ask what happens if there is a one, what do you? What are you Nobody can hear you. Would it be possible to hold the question until the question and answer session? He's almost finished. Yeah, I'm almost this finished. I'm almost finished. This is really, really crucial. We are discussing, we're comparing me. apples and oranges if we use PCR rates from chemotherapies to discuss PCR rates from immunotherapy. And we draw no conclusions from PCR rates from chemotherapy in melanoma, we don't use chemotherapy to PCR rates that we want to discuss in immunotherapy and targeted therapy. Okay, so, and, so and I, I, can, I can address that. I've shown already previously that the PCR rate in targeted therapy is different from the PCR rate in, in immunotherapy. I, I can address that in, 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 so the, in the question period, thanks. Um, the, suppose we have um, a 20% improvement in, in experimental therapy, as we d discussed in that uh, panel uh, A. What does it mean? It means you take 40% of the patients from the no PCR and move them up to the PC, to, toward the PCR, and 60% in the experimental arm. So what does that mean in terms of the hazard ratio? It looks like these curves are really separated, and they are. But when you compare it to not a 100% change in PCR rate, but a 20% range, uh, 
the hazard ratio is only 0.86. So you're back in the single treatment arm, which is going to take uh, not uh, the, uh, you know, a few hundred patients, but still back to the many thousands of patients. Uh, in this particular example, you're going to need 1,800 patients to show the benefit. Um, and um, what, what you'd ought to do is, in this single uh, 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 trial uh, per, uh, uh, issue, is to have an adaptive trial. So maybe the relationship between EFS and PCR is not what you saw in your database, but it is something else. It might be better. It might be worse. You want to look at the at the data as they're accruing in that trial, and and adapt to it, and potentially stopping for futility, but potentially re-estimating the sample size based on what you're seeing and extrapolating from the PCR to uh, the EFS. So it works in practice, and this is uh, you can get my slides and and uh, refer back in predicting. Uh, based on the uh, the CT Neo BC uh, data and uh, my summary, reasonably likely versus validated, patient level versus trial level, uh, demonstrating surrogacy from RCTs, but also from single arm trials, and um, designing trials, learning about in the context of the therapy, whether it's immunotherapy, whether it's chemotherapy, whatever therapy. Uh, you can adapt to what you're seeing is the relationship between PCR and EFS. So thank you. We have a few minutes for questions. Uh, Dr. Perry, do you want to start by answering the question you received? Dr. Berry, do you want to start by answering the question? Oh, oh, the question. So, yes, indeed. And, and uh, uh, Angie talked about ISPY2. And ISPY2, we've had chemotherapy, she indicated. We've had immunotherapy. Um, and you might ask, so in immunotherapy, as she indicated, we're seeing really amazing uh, PCR rates. Uh, pembrolizumab, for example, graduated. I like to tell this story. Graduated when we had exactly one patient through surgery. How can that be? Graduated means we've concluded that it's a, it's a beneficial therapy in comparison to control on the basis of PCR rate. The reason was, one of the reasons is the time machine that, uh, that uh, uh, Angie talked about, but the other is that we do MRIs over the course of time um, and we uh, predict whether or not a patient is going to be a PCR or a non-PCR. And we had 20 or so patients who were through uh, some part of the, the therapy. We, we do uh, our MRIs at three weeks and at 12 weeks. And our, the prediction was just amazing. This thing was melting the tumor away. But that said, we still concluded that if you achieve a PCR, you do essentially the same thing, whether that PCR is on chemotherapy or on immunotherapy. And he, 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 he wants you to know that he's shaking his head no. Okay. Uh, Dr. Tapalian's next. Speakers talking about breast cancer, which is something that many of us don't don't know a lot about. Uh, I just want to clarify: in the clinical trials that have been discussed, uh, did most of those trials include post-operative ad adjuvant therapy? And wouldn't that, you know, make it more complicated to determine the effects of the neoadjuvant component if the adjuvant was effective? Yeah, so this is my optimism. Uh, indeed, it is becoming the thing to, to do. I mean, it used to be that we've, and we've quite, uh, uh, quite well established that neoadjuvant equals adjuvant. But as you point out, 
PCR is, is a marker or the amount of residual disease is a marker. And so you can, and people and there have been two major studies published in the New England Journal showing that when you treat patients who have no PCR, you can benefit them, reducing their hazard by 40, 50%. And so it's no longer true that neoadjuvant equals adjuvant. Neoadjuvant is better than adjuvant because of this. Uh, but it, as you point out, it confounds the issue of showing surrogacy. Um, and Angie can, Angie can discuss what, we, what we've seen in iSpy2. But increasingly, it's going to be a huge problem. And we never, we may never get to see validated surrogacy for precisely that reason, but you know, it might not matter. But so we're trying so, to learn, you know, from your experience how to move forward in, in melanoma. So if you can Yeah. So all of the data I showed you leading up to where we are now was uh, in an era where adjuvant therapy was not modified on the basis of whether or not a patient achieved a PCR or not. And so we collected that data, but generally speaking, it was standard. And the patients with and without a PCR got the same therapy. And that was our opportunity to be able to look at the relationship between PCR and EFS. And as Don said, that has changed. That has changed dramatically in breast cancer within the last two to three years, where we now have several new therapies in different subtypes that have shown that you can, in a sense, rescue a patient who didn't have a PCR mm -hmm. in the adjuvant setting by giving them something better than what we used to give. And that clearly creates a bias, clearly biases us toward the null in not being able to show that getting a PCR would improve EFS. And that was largely the reason why we are evolving the trial, because we realized that the era in which we could simply try to take a drug and show that a very high PCR rate was gonna to lead to improved DFS was over because we, unless we deprived patients who were non-PCR patients of getting something better, we weren't gonna be able to show that difference. So I think our thinking has evolved to say, what is the role of PCR now in drug development? If we know for an individual patient that getting a PCR is a good thing, and I think we all could agree that that has been shown, then we can use PCR as a goal, uh, a short-term goal, in terms of being able to get patients to that goal, because if they get to PCR, they wouldn't necessarily then have to get more aggressive therapy adjuvantly. So we've had to change our thinking, and we're still evolving. But I think that that has really led us to say, okay, then maybe our strategy in terms of benefiting the population of patients with breast cancer is going to be increasing the proportion of those women who get to PCR. Because at the end of the day, that's what's ultimately going to minimize the amount of treatment they get. And along with that has been not just adding additional drugs, but actually changing the strategy. So what we encountered, the other thing we've encountered is a ceiling effect. As we were adding drugs and getting higher and higher PCR rates, which you saw with pembrolizumab uh, and is gonna be the case with other checkpoint inhibitors, uh, we start to get to the point where even if you added something else, you couldn't really increase the PCR rate so much more. And so, we really needed to pivot and think about, well then, now it's a matter of figuring out what's the best therapy for this individual patient that increases her likelihood of getting to a PCR. And sometimes that'll mean actually getting less therapy than you would have gotten a standard of care. Because if we can figure out early on that this patient's on the trajectory, we could stop after six weeks and let that patient go to surgery and ultimately have spared her toxic chemotherapy. So this is now where the precision comes in. This is not just the additive model, we're gonna tr keep trying to increase these PCR rates. Now it's, we've got a group of therapies that get us to high PCR rates. Let's figure out how to select the right therapy for the right patient so that 
a higher proportion of the population gets to PCR. So um, to add to the comments, uh, regarding the trials that were included in the analyses, there were old trials and they were like chemotherapy, majority of them that, so nothing was given after um, the PC, PCR was assessed. Um, in contrast, for example, with the anti hr 2 therapies, after patients are actually getting their surgery, they get anti hr 2 therapy um, for about like a year. So that, that may dilute the effect. Um, and um, I, we also, I wanted to add that we also have negative uh, examples. For example, we had lipatinib, which had a very impressive improvement in PCR rate over like 24% or 25%. Um, and basically, uh, it is approved in metastatic setting, but it had absolutely no effect in the adjuvant trials. So we can't, like, even though in Progetta setting, we said that 18% improvement actually sort of translated to that as small, but, you know, uh, so statistically significant improvement in the IDFS in the adjuvant trial, but we also have that, um, you know, in uh, at least in the breast cancer community. So um, I think it's uh, basically um, that basically translates to our current thinking that um, also we deal with that L patients have other options after surgery, especially for the HER2 positive. Um, we have the uh, Ketsila. For the triple negative, we have uh, you know other options of chemotherapy, and the other issue is that for ER positive patients, regardless of their PCR, they do so well. So we have some subtypes within the breast cancer that they're not sensitive to you know chemotherapy or immunotherapy um, to a similar extent, for example, to triple negative breast cancer, but in fact their outcomes are much better um, regardless of whether they get. PCR or not. So there's clearly lots to unpack here, um, and I hope we'll have um, a lot more time for a discussion of some of these issues in the um, in the last uh, discussion session. We have time for one more comment or question. Um, I have a question for the FDA, because in the melanoma field, we are now facing the advent that we want to do a randomized trial, neoadjuvant versus adjuvant. And you, in your models that you showed, I missed this a little bit because with the neoadjuvant treatment, exactly what you discussed already, we will have more information and you might de-escalate for the patients that have a PCR upon immunotherapy and you might want to escalate in non-responders. Mm -hmm. So how, from your perspective, you see the point that, that you still can attribute the benefit from the whole populations that got neoadjuvant therapy towards the neoadjuvant therapy and not only to the information advantage that I have when I give neoadjuvant therapy against uh, adjuvant therapy where I do something blind. So it, it, it's, it was it's a, a, question a, for a, very, a very good question. It, it's, uh, it's an inferentially difficult problem, as you indicate. What you need to do, I mean, when you're doing a, a trial to have any credibility, you've got to specify, you know, what is the therapy? And the therapy may be a sequence. And so what you're drawing conclusions about is, you know, it's an if-then uh, sequence. It's a complicated uh, sequence to then attribute to one therapy as opposed to uh, another therapy, you know, the salvage therapy. It's a very difficult inferential question, and we struggled with that. We've been struggling with that from the beginning in iSpy2 to build a... Um, uh, a, a trial that could have, that could look at sequences, look, look at changing therapies over time. It's hard, uh, it's essential. We statisticians have to come up to uh, where the biologists are and we're, we're, we're failing so far. But it is, a, um, it, it is a possible thing to do, it's just that it's difficult. So there are some statistical ways that maybe could address that issue. Um, one way is that actually you don't even do that one single trial model. So uh, basically just use a two trial model. But if you were gonna actually use the single trial model, you could um, actually um, plan for a controlled way of giving options of de-escalation or adding therapy mm -hmm. in after assessment of your, you know, PCR. So for example, you can 
randomize patients to have that option. Mm -hmm. But obviously that randomization will affect the results ultimately, but at least it will be like in a controlled fashion. So after um, achieving PCR or no PCR, then there will be a second randomization, for example, in both control arm and the study arm. And then um, obviously then it will be um, in a controlled fashion. This will affect the sample size tremendously. Also at the end, it will definitely um, make the, um, you know, uh, the association of PCR to the EFS um, be, you know, almost impossible to assess, but at least you have it in a controlled fashion. Um, and so we'll... Uh, and, and for example, we, with this in, uh, information, from a statistical point, uh, very nice that you say, okay, if you have a non-response, you just get nothing or you get an alternative. But for, for ethical reasons and for the patient's views, this is absolutely not feasible. For so, the responders, you're saying? Non-responders. non, non -response. So, I mean, I guess the question is, is it a standard of care or not? Because if it is standard of care, then you cannot randomize. And that's basically going to be the issue of your trial design. We're, and um, that's not going to be possible. We're going to have quite a bit more I, I discussion just want to on point out. Of, I just want well, to point out that statisticians are ethical. And we, <laughs> we, and, and, and we tailor what we do to precisely what you're saying. So I, know our speaker, I have an important we, we, comment to <laughs> just actually, I really need Dr. DiMichele to help us here. This is, you know, you guys in breast cancer have done an amazing job. Um, I'm a medical oncologist from MD Anderson, and, and what you laid out for us as the kind of the steps to get to, to where you are um, is actually kind of coming together as an entire community, which I think we've done very well in the setting of the International Neoadjuvant Melanoma Consortium. Two, you set out the pathologic complete response mm -hmm. being standardized, which we also did, and it's actually part derived from RCB, so kind of really well established there. I think the third question, which is really what I we hope to get some of your feedback on, is how did you manage to engage pharma partners so that they can help you develop novel drugs in this setting? Because we are still not that successful at doing that in melanoma. Well, I will just say, because I know that we do need to take a break and move on, and I'm happy to talk to you about that offline. But I think the key is to, under, to align the, um, the uh, incentives. and. I think that there has been, um, there, the pharma partners recognize that there was a potential path to accelerated approval and that by doing something that was very efficient, that it was going to be cost effective for them to test their drug in our, uh, in our, in our trial. Uh, and I think that was really key. We've, uh, we also have very stringent IP and reporting guidelines, and I'm happy to share those with you later. So this has been a so great- I, I, So I have a lot of experience okay. in other diseases. Um, I spy 2 may be yeah. unique. I mean, I tried to do it 20 years ago in metastatic breast cancer, at MD Anderson, uh, and um, I, I failed. I mean, the you, you couldn't get a company to, to play in the same sandbox as Pfizer or Novartis or whatever. Um, the, the world has changed somewhat, uh, but there still is this pre-competitive uh, issue. We've been amazingly successful in iSpy2, and for that I credit uh, Angie and uh, Laura Esserman and uh, the various people that are working with pharma for doing it. But I've tried the same thing in melanoma, not for neoadjuvant, but for uh, metastatic, uh, to build a platform trial and worked with PPD for five years. I called, we called it MyCAD, Melanoma Inter, Inter, International uh, Consortium of Adaptive Trials, to build a platform trial, and we failed. We never got pharma involved. I'm currently working in pancreatic cancer and uh, in GBM to do the same thing. We're having some success, but there is this notion among pharma, uh, and I know there's pharma here, uh, there is this notion among pharma that I can do it, I've always done it, I know how to do it, I want to control it, and I'm not giving up any of my control to some fluky uh, people wherever they are. Uh, it, but, you know, and, and we've had amazing support from the FDA. 
Okay. And Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. We really do have to stop. This is it's wonderful to see the engagement. We <laughs> We're going to move directly into